So let's talk about animal cells versus plant cells again for just a second. So animal and plant cells, they have a lot of things in common, which we've already mentioned, right? Um, but there are some major differences. So animal cells have centrioles, centrosomes, and lysosomes. Um, and these play important roles in uh, setting the poles for cell division, uh, particularly the centrioles and the centrosomes do. Uh, lysosomes, right, that's our digestive space. Um, but plant cells don't have those structures. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more later in the semester about the role of particularly the centrosomes and the centrioles. Um, but plant cells use a different scheme for cellular waste um, as opposed to the lysosomes. Um, plant cells have a cell wall. Uh, they have chloroplasts and something called plasma desmata. They also possess plastids um, and a large central vacuole. Mm. Uh, this big storage space. Um, animal cells don't have those things. Um, the cell wall and plastids and the central vacuole all have to do with uh, structural differences that we see in plant versus animal cells, how they maintain their shape, the way they're connected to other cells. Um, there's a rigidity to plant cells that animal cells lack in most cases. Um, and then of course chloroplasts, right? That's how plants uh, carry out photosynthesis. We don't see photosynthesis in animal cells. All right, so let's look at a few of these plant cell specific structures. We have the cell wall. This is a rigid covering external to the plasma membrane and it protects the cell. Uh, it's gonna provide structural support. It's gonna give the cell its shape. Um, some fungal cells and protists do have cell walls as well. Um, some of the fungal cell walls differ from plant cell walls, but some of the protist cell walls are very, very similar to plant cell walls. Um, the cell wall is mostly composed of cellulose. Uh, chloroplasts, so right, this is uh, for photosynthesis, the organelle for photosynthesis. Um, photosynthesis is gonna utilize carbon dioxide, water, and the energy from light to make glucose and oxygen. Um, oxygen is a, a byproduct, a happy byproduct for us, um, but the real main product goal of photosynthesis is glucose, sugar molecules. Um, plants are called autotrophs because they're able to make their own food, auto eat, so they make their own food. Um, whereas animals are considered heterotrophs, meaning that they eat other things. Um, so they have to rely on other organisms for their food source. Heterotrophs often eat autotrophs. Uh, all right, there's that central vacuole I mentioned. Um, it plays a key role in regulating the cell's concentration of water in changing environmental conditions. Uh, this is really, really important. And we'll talk about uh, turbidity a in a little bit here. Um, but plant cells need to maintain a particular shape and that cell wall dictates that shape, right? If the cell is filled with too much water, um, it could burst, um, but the if there's too little water, it'll shrivel up. Um, but the central vacuole helps keep a store of water that helps maintain the appropriate water concentration in that cell so that it can maintain the appropriate shape, not dry out, not get too full. Um, we call the that pressure, we call it turgor pressure. All right? um, so that's just an outward pressure that is caused by the fluid inside the cell and it helps hold that cell's shape. Um, it's what makes plants uh, stiff and how they stay um, stay upright. Um, so if you have, like, if you think about like flowers, like cut flowers that you keep because um, they're pretty, over time they'll start to droop down. They've lost the turgor pressure in their stems. Um, but if you give them fresh water, sometimes they'll perk back up a little bit if they're if they're cut. If they're a live plant, obviously, if you have a live plant and its leaves are drooping, give it water and it will fill back up. All right. So. Uh, all right, let's take a moment and talk a little bit about the origin of mitochondria and chloroplasts. Uh, we believe that these two organelles have their original origin as ancient free living bacteria, um, alpha proteobacteria in the case of the mitochondrion and uh, some kind of blue green algae type bacteria for, uh, for the chloroplast. Um, the idea is that ancestral eukaryotic cells, so before they had mitochondria and chloroplasts, that they engulfed prokaryotic cells. And, and that makes sense, right? They were larger and 
they got to eat something, right? So they're, they're engulfing these bacteria. But uh, the mitochondrion, when it was a free-living alpha proteobacteria, was capable of something called aerobic respiration. So in the presence of oxygen, these little bacteria could produce a whole lot of energy. Well, if you can imagine for a moment that a larger eukaryote engulfs it, and the advantage it would have by having this free living little thing inside it that was producing all this energy. Well, in that little alpha proteobacteria, well now it's living inside another organism and it's protected from being eaten by other things. And that organism is providing the raw materials it needs to make ATP. So now all of a sudden you have this relationship that's beneficial to both the, you know, the little early mitochondrion producing all this energy because it's getting all the resources it needs and it's protected and the larger eukaryote getting all this energy it needs to go out and get those resources. So you have this, this give and take relationship that's very beneficial to both. Over time, these little intracellular guests, if you will, uh, evolve to become some symbiotic permanent partners, providing energy through that oxidative phosphorylation process. And uh, eventually that completely changes the uh, energetic landscape for eukaryotic cells. Uh, we know that uh, the endosymbiotic relationship with mitochondria happened first because all animal and plant cells, all eukaryotic cells, have mitochondria. Uh, there are a couple of odd exceptions, but research has shown us that they don't lack a mitochondria, like as in they never had one. They had one that they lost over time as they found other ways to um, produce their own energy. And then chloroplasts were engulfed later, uh, later down the line and are only present in a handful of the, uh, the different branches of the eukaryotic tree of life. All right, so just a little fun uh, kind of biology history lesson for a second there. Um, so supporting evidence, how do we, you know, what made us think this? Um, when we look at chloroplasts and mitochondria, they have their own DNA. They have little circular DNA inside them Oh, that sounds like bacteria, right? Um, and when we sequence it, it aligns with those particular groups of, of bacteria. There are two membranes, the original membrane and then one they acquired when they were engulfed. Um, if you look back at uh, uh, lysosomes, the way it like, invaginates and engulfs like bacteria, it's, you can see that a membrane forms around it. So you have these two membranes. Um, they're about the right size to be bacterial of uh, bacterial origin, and they reproduce by binary fission the same way that bacteria do. That's right. Mitochondria and chloroplasts go through replication and division inside of the eukaryotic, formerly host but now permanent partner. Um, so we have we have some really nice strong evidence for this this relationship and how it evolved. All right. Back to organelles. Now, extracellular matrix, technically not so much an organelle, but it's a really important part of the cell. So the extracellular matrix is this network of substances that are secreted by the cell. So these are uh, proteins and um, carbohydrates. Um, in many cases, something that we'll call a glycoprotein, which is a protein with sugars bound to it. Um, oftentimes collagen is in this matrix. So they're secreted, they're created in the um, endoplasmic reticulum. They are modified and transported and tagged through the Golgi apparatus. And then they are sent to the plasma membrane where they are then uh, released, secreted, uh, outside of the cell and attached via special um, structures on the plasma membrane. Um, these structures, this, this matrix of glycoproteins is very, very important for cell communication. Um, some of these glycoproteins play a really important role in how your immune system recognizes every cell in your body as self as opposed to foreign invaders. Um, and these proteins go wrong sometimes when we look at cancer cells and it's why cancer cells, um, certain types, can evade the immune system response. All right, cells can also communicate with each other via direct contact. Um, so where the membrane of one cell is in tight contact with the membrane of another cell, um, and they're connected by these intracellular junctions. All right, so the extracellular matrix played a role in you know, sending signals out and maybe they connect with each other. 
Um, and then there's a whole array of signaling proteins on the surface of the, um, the cell membrane that can interact with neurotransmitters and things, second messengers, all sorts of stuff. But from cell to cell, we have these special junctions. So we have plasmodesmata, which are junctions between plant cells. They're a very specific type of junction. We have tight junctions, gap junctions, and desmosomes um, that are all junctions found in animal cells, and they all play different roles. We'll look at those a little more closely. So again, plasmodesmata, these are channels between the cell walls of two adjacent plant cells, and it allows communication and the flow of um, nutrients to a lesser extent, but most importantly, like if a cell in the plant experiences stress, like say being cut, uh, it will send a signal up um, ahead to uh, other cells, letting it know that you know something happened, that there was danger. Um, we see this in, um, what are those called? Uh, oh, like touch me not plants. Like you touch the cell and it signals and the whole plant will retract. Really, really neat stuff. Um, tight junctions, these join adjacent plant cells and they are what they sound like. They hold the cells very close together. Uh, desmosomes join two animal cells together as well, um, but they also play an important role as uh, junction points, connection points for internal cytoskeleton uh, structures and help um, the cell retain its structure and also um, to handle uh, like shearing pressure. So we see a lot of these in um, your skin and in connective tissues. Uh, gap junctions act as channels between animal cells. Um, and these are, they're like little holes. And uh, again, signaling molecules can pass between these. Okay, good job sticking with that really long section. Um, your book has a really nice table that summarizes all of this at the end of this section. Um, I suggest creating a table of your own to help organize everything, uh, especially if you know that you're going to be tested over you know, knowing the function, the structures, the locations of these various different organelles. A table is a really nice way to organize all that and practice just filling it in on your own. All right, I will see you all in the next video.